Okay. Welcome to another terrific program at Neurowitz Center. Thanks for joining us. And I am Laura Bryant. Happy to see everyone today. We've got a big turnout. Today's session is part one of a three-part program featuring our virtual tour of New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Our special guide today is Ilana Kaplan, a former St. Louisan, I don't know where she went to high school, and museum educator and lecturer for the Met. She will be focusing on Impressionist artists this afternoon. Next month, part two, she'll talk about Alice Neal, an American social justice champion. And in April, which will be part three, she will cover the Met stained glass window collection. We have a, like I said, we have a very big turnout for today's program, which is a reflection of our speaker as well as the subject matter. And it's truly a pleasure to welcome you back, Ilana. We are very, very happy to see you again. You are definitely one of our most popular headliners. So thank you. And um, I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Great, okay. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, thanks for all your work arranging this program and for having me back. It's, uh, I always love presenting to St. Louis groups. Um, I grew up in St. Louis and I always uh, have a special affinity for St. Louis. Um, and we are gonna be doing, looking at works of art from the Met mostly today and doing a virtual tour. But I wanted to include a couple of works of art from the St. Louis Art Museum just to connect us. And you know, for people who are there um, you know, locally, if you want to see some of these artists, uh, you know, in your museum. And it was really fun for me to do some re research on the uh, St. Louis Art Museum on the SLAM uh, website and, and learn more about uh, the Impressionist paintings there. Of course, I've been to the museum many times when I visited, um, and it's a, it's a wonderful collection that, that uh, uh, at the St. Louis Art Museum. Okay, so I'm going to start with my screen share. Okay, so our topic for today is Impressionism. And I'm going to give a little bit of a background on the Impressionist movement, but um, instead of looking at this kind of boring screen, we'll have uh, an Impressionist painting at least to look at. We'll have a Pissarro painting in the background, um, but I am gonna start off with a background on Impressionism just to, um, I know many of us are familiar with the art movement, but just to kind of go over some of the highlights of the movement. So Impressionism was a 19th century art movement that began as a loose association of Paris-based artists who began exhibiting their art publicly in the 1860s. The name of the movement is actually derived from a painting by Claude Monet called Impressionism Sunrise, which provoked an art critic to call the group of artists Impressionists as a derogatory term. So actually the name Impressionism was given to this group of artists um, kind of criticizing the type of art that they were creating. Um, and of course, now we, I think, use it as a, a, you know, see it as a very popular movement. So it's interesting how that's changed over, the, over time. So I'm gonna tell you some of the characteristics of, of Impressionist painting and we'll look for them in the paintings that we see today. Some of the characteristics of Impressionist painting include visible brushstroke, open composition, emphasis on light and its changing qualities and ordinary subject matter. And we'll explore all of these uh, in the paintings that we look at today. Now, why were these characteristics criticized, right? I said at the beginning that Impressionism was a criticism of the paintings. Why were these characteristics criticized? Because they were so different from past art movements. Impressionist artists were viewed as radicals because they really broke the rules of academic paintings. Uh, in the past, Previous artists focused on historical or religious scenes, or if they painted landscapes, they would paint them indoors in their studio, mostly from sketches, and they would rework and work and rework their paintings in order to achieve the desired visual effects. The Impressionists changed all of this. Uh, they weren't doing religious paintings, they weren't doing historical paintings, um, and their landscapes, of course, were painted outdoors. The Impressionists took the art of painting out of the studio and into the world. They began making finished landscape paintings outside on plain air. So they didn't do sketches in their studios beforehand. They were doing their finished paintings outside. They wanted to paint spontaneously on the spot to capture the ever-changing effects of light and atmosphere of a particular moment as they were looking at it rather than making sketches outdoors and then returning to their studio to make a painting based on their sketches. Impressionists also use short broken brush strokes of pure unmixed colors rather than smoothing blended colors as was a custom of the time. 
The Impressionists also painted realistic scenes of modern life, and they emphasized the vivid overall effects rather than details. So the, the public at first was very hostile to this kind of painting. Uh, and as I said, it was, it was much criticized at the beginning, but gradually people came to believe the Impressionist had captured a fresh and original vision, even if it didn't receive the approval of the art critics and the establishment at the beginning. So the main Impressionist artists that many of us have heard of are uh, Camille Pissarro, who we're gonna begin with, this is his painting, um, also Claude Monet, Manet, uh, Auguste Renoir, Edgar Degas, Bertha Marsat, and Mary Cassatt. So we're gonna look at a few of those artists today, not all of them, but we'll look at a few of them and uh, a few of each of their paintings. So we're gonna start with Camille Pissarro. And as I said, this is one of his paintings that we're starting with. Um, uh, an interesting uh, fact that I think not many people are aware of is that uh, Camille Pissarro was actually the only Jewish impressionist. Um, and that's not such a well-known fact about him. His birth name was uh, Jacob Abraham Camille Pissarro. Um, that's not written on the labels on his paintings. He's just referred to as Camille Pissarro. Um, and uh, his family actually came from a long line of Spanish Portuguese conversos. Uh, his grandfather moved from Portugal to France and then uh, Camille's father relocated to the island of St. Thomas. And that's where Camille Pissarro was born in St. Thomas. Um, at the time that he was born, uh, which was 1830, St. Thomas was a major commercial center. So it was known as a place where people could practice their faith freely. And it was home to a small Jewish community. Um, and that's why uh, many Jews went there to be able to practice the religion freely. Um, now he had a, um, a very interesting upbringing. And for anyone who's interested in reading more about it, uh, his, a great historical uh, fiction book about his life is uh, The Marriage at Opposites by Alice Hoffman. Um, it is historical fiction, but it's based on his life. And it's a really interesting book, a lot about his mother uh, and, and his parents and, and their marriage um, and Camille's uh, life growing up. So a little bit of a background about him while we're looking at this first painting. So this painting is called The Garden of the Tuileries on a Spring Morning. It was painted in 1899 when Pissarro was actually 69 years old. Uh, he lived to be 73. Um, and this was painted much later in his life. Um, I'm gonna tell you the size of, of the paintings because in a PowerPoint, they all look the same size. So I'll make sure to uh, tell you the size of them. This one is 28 uh, and 7 8 inches by 36 and a fourth inches. So this painting is a part of a series of six paintings that Pissarro painted from his apartment window. Um, and you can see it's a bird's eye view. He's looking down onto this garden of the Tuileries. Um, he actually from his apartment also had a view of the Louvre, but we don't see that. Uh, we don't see the museum in this painting. The Met actually owns three of uh, his paintings that he did of the garden of the Tuileries. As I said, it's a series of six paintings of the garden and the Met owns three of them. Um, and we can see here that spring has arrived. You can see the blooming trees, uh, the soft blue sky. Um, you can also see a lot of uh, people walking around enjoying the spring day, including here on the bottom, you can see a woman pushing a uh, baby carriage over here. Um, lots of people out walking and enjoying uh, the park. Also notice the twin steeples of the church in the background, um, and they punctuate the vast expanse of the sky. Now, Pissarro was an artist who was very attentive to changes in light, atmosphere, and climate, but he's also showing us the comings and goings of, of people and strollers at different times of day um, and different seasons of the year, as we'll see in, in some of his paintings. And by noticing all these details, he was able to extract a variety of views from a single site. So basically, he is painting the same uh, Garden of the Tuileries in different seasons, different times of day, to show how the same um, the same setting looks different depending on the season, the time of day, uh, atmosphere and light. And again, he's not focusing on details of people, but we're getting an overall impression, uh, an overall feeling, a mood and atmosphere. Um, so let's look at his um, next painting. So as you can see, this is the same park. This is also the Garden of the Tuileries, but you can tell right away it's a different season, a different time of day. So this is the Garden of the Tuileries on a winter afternoon, also painted in 1899. And again, it's one of the, the uh, 
the one of the six paintings in this in this series. And this one is a very similar size. It's 29 inches by 36 and a fourth inches. So again, we're looking at the same exact um, scene, but a different season and a different time of day. As we're looking at it, notice the hallmarks of Impressionist paintings. Again, it's a scene of everyday modern life. It's a landscape. It focuses on light and color the effects of atmosphere and season and time of day ra rather than on form or realism. So we see that there are a lot of people in the park walking. We can't see specific details of these people. You know, we just get this impression of, you know, people walking and enjoying this winter afternoon day. Again, it suggests a mood and an atmosphere, a moment rather than focusing on the details of people. Um, so let's just look at these two paintings by Pissarro side by side. So you can really get an idea of what he's trying to do here with these series paintings. Again, we have on the left, the one that the Garden of the Tuileries on a spring morning, and on the right, uh, the Garden of the Tuileries on a winter afternoon. So again, he's showing us the same park and how it, the, how it looks, how it, the, uh, uh, it changes based on season, um, time of day, how it changes the exact same, um, uh, the exact same scene. And as I said, this is one of six, the Met owns three of them. Um, and uh, Pissarro actually wrote a number of letters when he was writing these paintings. And he wrote one in December of 1898. And he wrote from Paris that he had gotten an apartment at 204 Rue de Rivoli, opposite the Tuileries Garden, with a superb view of the garden, which we see here. He could also see, as I said, the Louvre to the left, which we don't see in these paintings. Um, and then in the background, there's some, you can see there's some houses in the background. Um, there's also the, the church that I pointed out and lots of chestnut trees. And uh, he found this a very beautiful scene to paint and he looked forward to it. So during the following winter and spring, he painted six uh, scenes of the what we're looking at here and then eight cityscapes which point toward the Louvre. Um, and as I said, the, the, the Met owns three of them. Uh, another painting by Pissarro that we have at the Met is this, the Boulevard Montmartre on a winter morning in 1897. So again, you can see that he's painting in all different seasons, different times of day. This is, uh, the size of it is 25 and a half inches by 32 inches. And he painted several series also of these Grand Boulevard paintings. He was staying at a hotel called the Grand Hotel de Russie in early 1897. And he marveled that he really could see down the whole length of the boulevard with a bird's eye view. And he could see uh, the carriages, the omnibuses, the people um, between the big trees and the houses as well. Um, so he actually, between February and April, made 14 paintings of the Boulevard Montmartre. And he really wanted to show how urban life was developing under his window. And again, you know, uh, Characteristics of Impressionist paintings, it's a scene of everyday life. Um, it's uh, giving us the impression we can't see details of the people or the omnibuses or the horses, or but we get an, uh, an, an overall impression of what's going on. We can clearly see the season is winter with the bare trees and the, uh, some white on the, on the ground and some white on the, on the carriages also. Um, so uh, I wanted to, uh, so these are all from the Met. But I just wanted to uh, show one work of art that you have at the St. Louis Art Museum. You actually, I saw on the website that you have three Pissarro uh, works of art. Two of them are on view. The one that was most interesting to me is actually not on view right now, but it's this one. Um, and the reason I thought this was so interesting is because this is uh, a work, it's called Houses and Palm Trees um, that Pissarro did. And it's a drawing. Um, and he did it in 1855 when he was still in St. Thomas. So all the paintings I was showing you were done in Paris uh, and a lot of his paintings were done in France, but this one was done in St. Thomas where he was born. Um, he was born there. He actually went to high school when, from the ages of 12 to 17. Um, and he visited the Louvre when he was in high school in France and he studied European art. Then he returned back to St. Thomas uh, where he continued to draw. This is when he made this drawing. Um, and he was also working in his family's um, business. But his French teacher encouraged him to draw the local scenery of St. Thomas. And this is what he called this drawing, houses and palm trees. And so I thought this really connects us. This is at the St. Louis Art Museum, but it's not on view right now. Um, but again, it shows us, you know, his, that he was born in St. Thomas and is, you know, a very early work. He was 25 years old when he, when he did this. Um, okay, so now we are going to go into the Met. 
uh, for a couple of minutes just to look at some of these paintings on the wall. Now, for any of you who have been to my programs before, you'll you'll remember that uh, we do do a virtual tour, um, but you might be um, wondering to yourself, like we can't see the paintings so clearly. These are some of the paintings we just saw. Um, and that's because the Met's virtual technology was done. They worked with Google, Google Street View in the year 2010, which at the time was like at the you know forefront of all this technology. But now, um, 12 years later, uh, almost 13 years later, it's not as advanced as other virtual tours that you might have seen. But I think it's still important to come in and see it just to give you an idea of the works of art, the room, the size of the painting. So we looked at um, the one on the left here is the Boulevard Montmartre. We also looked at two of the view views of the Garden of the Tuileries. Remember, I said they have three. Um, we didn't look at this one close up, but we looked at these two. You can see how these paintings are all very similar sizes. They're all three on the wall next to each other. So the viewer can stand and really compare the three views of the garden and see you know, the different seasons and different time of day. Now, this is a, in a room full of works of art by Pissarro. The Met has uh, a room full of uh, just Pissarro paintings. Um, a lot of the Impressionists, Monet has three rooms of paintings in the Met, but uh, a lot of the Impressionists in, uh, have multiple paintings uh, in the museum. But you get an idea of different uh, Pissarro paintings. He, as I said, painted everyday scenes, landscape. He also did a lot of paintings of people, you know, working in the fields, working in gardens, um, and the paintings, the paintings that all the paintings that we have in this room are from his time in France. So that's why I thought it was so unique uh, that the uh, that the St. Louis Art Museum has that uh, drawing that he did when he was in St. Thomas. Okay, so now we're going to move back to our uh, PowerPoint and on to our next artist, which is probably I would say the most famous impressionist, and that's Claude Monet. Um, so. He was a friend and fellow painter with Camille Pissarro. Both of them have been referred to as the fathers of French Impressionism, probably because they were the elder statesmen of the group. So I'm going to give a little bit uh, of a uh, talk a little bit about this painting, actually, for a little while, because um, it's one of my favorite Monet paintings that we have at the Met. And it's one of his earlier paintings. It was painted in 1867. Monet was only 27 years old at the time. Uh, Monet uh, was born in 1840 and he, he died in 1926. So he was 86 when he died. Um, and he painted till uh, um, very late um, in, in his years, as we'll see. So he painted this when he was 27 years old um, and he had spent the summer uh, at, uh, with his family at San Adres, which was a seaside resort near La Havre. And it was there that he painted this buoyant sunlit scene of contemporary leisure, um, enlisting his father. This is his father sitting here. His father's name was Adolf. Um, and he's sitting here with a Panama hat on. And also these are other relatives of his. So he used his relatives really as his models for this painting. Um, Monet's father is sitting mostly with his back to us. Um, we can see a little bit of his face, but not too much. We see actually that he's holding a walking stick. And next to Monet's father is Monet's cousin. And she's wearing a fashionable uh, black accented white dress and she's holding a parasol. We can't even see her face at all. Um, and they're looking out to a younger couple who's at the edge of the water. And these are also relatives. Um, the woman is also wearing a very fashionable white dress with red trim and holding a parasol. And the man is more formally dressed than Monet's father. He's wearing a top hat, as you can see, and a black jacket. He also has uh, a walking stick. So as you can see in this painting, Monet focuses more on um, the clothing of his relatives than on their facial features. We can't really see their faces, but we do see a lot of details of their clothing. Um, and the fact that he painted women in white dresses tells us that uh, these women really had a very leisurely refined existence. The fact that they were wearing white dresses mean that they were not you know, doing any physical work or you know, doing anything that would get them dirty. So we can see that this, the, the four people are surrounded by greenery, punctuated throughout by flowers. We can see red flowers and white flowers, yellow flowers, and the white flowers really um, echo the white color of their dresses. Some of the flowers that we see here are gladiolas, geraniums, and nasturtiums. Um, and then we have the color red um, in different places in this painting, and it really unifies um, the canvas. So we see red in the flowers, we see red in the flags up here, um, and the idea of using red in different places and in her dress 
Um, using the color red, it gets us to move our eyes around the canvas because there's a lot going on in this painting. It's a very busy painting. So using red in different places gets us to move our eyes around the painting. You might've noticed there's some red in the boats in the background as well. Um, we also have, so you might've recognized the flag. We have the French uh, tricolor flag, which flies high here at the right. The other flag at the left um, is actually the red and yellow flag is the flag of the local sailing club. And you can see that this house is very close to a sailing club because we see a lot of sailboats off in the distance. Um, we have sailboats on the left and then we have some steamboats on the right over here. So his aunt's house is very close to the local sailing club. Um, we have one sailboat that's much closer to us and we can see there are two people sitting on the sailboat and it has three sails. Um, and again, this is Monet showing us perspective. One boat is very close, it's much larger. The other boats uh, he painted looking much farther away, he painted them much smaller. Um, and then of course we have the, the steamboats which we said are in the distance and their um, uh, smoke is going off into the distance. Um, now we can see that there are very long shadows that are cast by the sun and that uh, indicates to us that it's a late afternoon. The other thing is Monet really clearly indicates not just the, the season, that it's summertime with the flowers and that it's late afternoon, but he also really indicates the weather in this painting, that it's a windy day, right? He shows us that the flags are blowing in the wind. He shows us the smoke blowing in the wind and even the waves in the water. So he shows us very clearly that it's a windy day. Um, and of course, the hallmarks of impressionist painting, the visible brushstroke, a scene of everyday life. Again, we don't see details of every flower or details of faces, but it gives us an overall impression and an overall view. Um, the painting, very interesting, is organized in three color bands. So we have the light blue uh, band of color for the sky in the background, the darker blue um, horizontal band of color for the uh, dark blue sea. And then in the foreground, we have this uh, green, um, color. Uh, Monet here also has a bird's eye view. He's looking down um, at the scene. He probably put his easel next to a second floor window of the villa so he could see it. And again, he's painting exactly what he sees. He's not making a sketch. He's not going to rework it in his studio, but he's painting exactly what he sees. Um, Monet spent many summers since his childhood along the shores of San Andres, uh, where the family owned um, a summer villa. Um, Monet has called this painting the single most important seascape uh, from the first decade of his career. Um, and we'll look at a couple of close-ups of this painting. So this is just some details, just very close up. So we can see here his father, Aldolf, sitting. Um, again, you can see the flowers and you'll notice we don't see details. We don't see every petal and uh, you know details of the flower, but really we get an impression, but we can see, we can very much see his brushstroke and how he uh, created the flowers. And here's a close up of uh, his cousin standing close to the water. Again, we don't see details of her face at all. It just kind of looks like her skin, but we get the impression of these two people. We can see the sailboat. And of course we can see his brushstroke very visible in the water. Um, and the closer you get to it, the more visible the brushstroke is. Uh, this is my daughter and I at the painting. Um, it's one of my favorite paintings, as I said. So this picture is from about a year ago um, when we were visiting the museum. Um, and we always make a stop at this at this painting. Okay, so here we have another Monet painting. Um, this is his son, Jean Monet, um, on his hobby horse. It was painted in 1872 when Jean was uh, five years old. The painting is 23 and 7 8 inches by 29 and a fourth inches. So now looking at this painting, you'll, um, you'll notice that uh, Jean is wearing uh, a dress and this is very typical clothing for boys at the, this time. Boys until about age five would wear dresses or skirts for practical reasons. It made potty training much easier. Uh, remember this is a time period before zippers and snaps were invented. So pants that they had at the time were very complicated and they had many accessories. So dresses for both boys and girls were much more practical. Um, when Monet painted the, this painting of his son, Jean, as I said, he painted it in the summer of 1872. So his family, he and his wife and his son, had recently returned to France. Um, they had been in London during the Franco-Prussian War. They moved to London during, uh, during the war, and then they moved back after the war. And through the efforts of his art dealer, Monet's finances had finally begun to improve. At the beginning, he was a very poor, struggling artist. His father, who we saw in the last painting, Adolf, had to really uh, give him money and support him. 
um, until he started uh, selling some works of art. So once he started selling a couple works of art, he was able to rent a house in Argentine, which was a suburb northwest of Paris. And this is actually uh, where this painting was painted. Um, this was the garden of their new home. So you'll notice about this painting, it's very freely and thinly painted. Uh, again, hallmarks of Impressionist painting, very visible brushstroke that we can see, uh, a scene of outdoor everyday life. Um, and interesting though, there are some parts that show bare canvas in this painting. Uh, Monet actually never exhibited this painting. He kept it for himself throughout his life. Um, okay, so now we're moving on to some paintings that might be more familiar to people. Um, this is uh, Haystacks, Effect of Snow and Sun. It was painted in 1891. So this is almost 20 years after the last painting that we were looking at. Um, the size of it is 25 and 3 fourths inches by 36 and a fourth inches. So between the summer of 1890 and the winter of 1891, Monet made about 30 paintings of these haystacks in a field near his house in Giverney. Uh, Monet used that year's grain harvest as the subject in the paintings. So although it's a very mundane uh, subject matter, haystacks, um, the underlying theme, of course, is the, the transience of light and the change of light and season and how it affects the subject matter. And the series showed Monet's brilliance in capturing light in the changing seasons and the time of day and weather. The paintings in this series include haystacks in all seasons and all times of day. You might have seen them in museums around the world. As I said, he painted 30 of them. So uh, they are, some of them uh, are in their museums around the world, including the Art Institute in Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Um, now, in order for Monet to work on many paintings, basically simultaneously, he would awake before dawn, so as to start at the earliest time of day. And as the morning progressed and the light changed, he would switch to sequentially later canvas settings, sometimes working on as many as 10 or 12 paintings a day, each one depicting a slightly different aspect of light. The process would be repeated over the course of days, weeks, or months depending on the weather and the progress of the paintings until they were completed. As the seasons changed, the process was renewed. So as we know, certain effects of light last only for a few minutes, and thus the canvas is documenting such a short amount of time received attention for only a few minutes a day. Further complicating matters, the light of subsequent sunrises, for example, could change. The light wasn't always the same. So it would require separate canvases within the series. So because of this, you, you see that it was a huge effort for him to do these series paintings. Monet wrote, and this is quote, I'm working very hard, struggling with a series of different effects of haystacks, but at this season, the sun sets so fast, I cannot follow it. The more I continue, the more I see that a great deal of work is necessary in order to succeed in rendering what I seek. So even though he worked very hard, uh, he was rewarded financially. The Haystack series was a financial success. Most of the paintings sold immediately for as much as a thousand francs. In addition, his painting prices in general began to rise steeply. And as a result, he was able to buy outright the house and grounds at Giverney and to start constructing his famous water lily pond, which we'll see some paintings of later on. Um, so after years of mere uh, subsistence living, he was now finally able to enjoy success. Monet and his family settled in Giverney, which is about 45 miles northwest of Paris in 1883. And although he took frequent trips, uh, venturing as far as London and Venice, most of his paintings from 1883 until his death 40 years later were scenes within the two mile radius of his home. Uh, he really um, loved the landscape near his home and he used that as a subject uh, for most of his paintings. And we'll see that in our next few paintings. So our next painting is called The Four Trees from 1891. It's 32 and a fourth inches by 32 and an eighth inch. So during the summer and fall of 1891, Monet painted a series of canvases depicting these trees. They're called poplar trees uh, along the Ept River. And again, this was about a mile from his house. Now he didn't paint the poplar trees from the opposite bank of the river. He actually painted them from his floating studio, which was his boat in the river. So he would take his boat out into the middle of the river and, and paint from there. And that's why we can't see the top of these four trees. We can just see the four vertical lines of the slender tree trunks. Also, if it weren't for this horizontal of the riverbank, um, the tree trunks would be indistinguishable from the reflection in the water. 
Um, Monet was working on this series of poplar tree paintings at the same time as his haystack series that we were just looking at. So he was very much involved in these series paintings, painting the same subject matter in different times of day and different seasons. And in both series, he took enormous pains to wait for and catch exactly the light that the picture demanded. Um, just an interesting um, story about these trees. Um, the series would, was actually temporary threatened because the village um, across from the Epte River, across the village, across from Giverney, decided that they were going to sell these trees at a local auction. So Monet had to pay a local lumber merchant to ensure that the trees would stay standing until he finished his paintings. Um, and as I said, he painted uh, most of them from his floating studio, which was a boat that was fitted with grooves to hold multiple canvases so that he could paint multiple canvases in his boat at the same time. He did paint a few of them from the uh, from the riverbank as well. Uh, and like the Haystack series, the poplars were, uh, the poplar paintings were very um, popular. Uh, they were exhibit as a series of 15 of them, and 15 of them were shown in Paris and an exhibit in 1892. Okay, our next painting is called Morning on the Seine near Giverney. It was painted in 1897 um, and it's 32 and an eighth inch by 36 and five eighths inches. So this series was actually begun in 1896, but it wasn't completed until 1897 because of inclement weather. Um, and again, there were 15 paintings in the series. Um, and again, Monet would go out in his uh, floating studio in his boat um, he would patiently scout out particular views around the river, and then he would decide where to paint. For an extended period of time, he arose before dawn and reached his boat before sunrise in order to paint the changing effects of light as the sun came up. Then he would line up the canvases on easels in his studio uh, and uh, complete them. Uh, again, they, he made 15 in this series between 1896 and 1897. And in this painting, we can see his continual interest in painting reflection, which we also saw in our last painting, right, with the reflection of the tree. So he's very interested in reflection um, and also painting paintings under various um, climate and seasonal conditions. So our next painting is a very famous one, it, starting the series of paintings that he did of his water lily uh, garden. And this is called Bridge Over a Pond of Water Lilies. It was painted in 1899 and it's 36 and a half by 29 inches. So just a little bit of a background of the water lily and, uh, and, um, and Monet. In 1893, Monet, who was a passionate horticulturalist, purchased uh, land with a pond near his property in Giverny, and he really wanted to build something special. He began construction of his water garden soon after he moved to Giverny. He had to petition local authorities to divert water from a local river in order to build this pond. And Monet remade the landscape with the same devotion as he applied to his paintings, and then he used his water lily garden in turn as his creative focus. Um, and of course, it was a much prized water lily garden. He had a team of outdoor workers helping him maintain his gardens at Giverny. And uh, Monet always said that had he not become a painter, he probably would have become a gardener. He loved gardening as, also. So in 1899, when he painted this painting, he began a series of 18 views of this wooden footbridge over the pond. And he completed 12 paintings, including the one we're looking at now in one summer. And that was the summer of 1899. So um, this painting has a vertical format, which is unusual in the series. Most of the series have a square format and it gives prominence to the water lilies. And of course, um, the reflection of the foliage in the water, right? So you see the foliage here and then the reflection in the water, well, that's what it gives it the, the color. And the watery surface unifies his canvas. You can see the sky has already disappeared from this painting. The lush foliage rises all the way to the horizon and the space is flattened by the decorative arch of the bridge. Um, and of course, we see the idea of reflection, not only in the um, foliage that's reflected in the water, but the reflection of the under part of the bridge, you can see right here in the water, the reflection of the bridge. Um, in later water lily paintings, which we'll see next, even more of the setting will evaporate and most of his later paintings are just the water surface. In all, Monet painted at least 100 images of his water lily pond over a period of more than 20 years. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, uh, the St. Louis Art Museum also has uh, a Monet water lily painting. 
So while most of the paintings from 1899 have these greenish tonalities, um, later paintings have uh, warmer colors, which we'll see. Um, now, I just wanna actually connect uh, this painting to what was going on historically at that time period. As I said, Monet painted this in 1899. Um, and that was actually uh, during the time period of the Dreyfus Affair in France. And of course, that time period was a very difficult time period in France. Dreyfus was, um, Captain Alfred Dreyfus was uh, Jewish and he was convicted of treason in 1894. Um, and until 1906, when he was exonerated, there was a lot of tension in France between pro-Dreyfus and anti-Dreyfus people. Um, now, Monet saw his water lily garden as kind of a utopian healing dream state. He wanted it to be a place that could heal French society from the rift. And his garden was an open place that people could come and visit. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a much later water lily painting. This one was done between 1916 and 1919. So we're talking about 17, between 17 and 20 years after our last water lily painting. And you'll probably notice a lot of differences between the two paintings. Um, just to tell you the size of this one, it's 51 and a fourth inches by 79 inches. So much larger than the last one. So from 1899 and on, Monet was pretty much painting his water lilies. He was trying to capture every observation, impression, and reflection of the flowers and water. By the time he began this work in 1916, he was 76 years old when he started this painting. Uh, and you can see he has a much new, fluid, and kind of audacious style of painting here, where the water lily pond has become the point of departure for an almost abstract work of art. This painting looks almost abstract. And you see here, we don't have the bridge anymore. We don't have the foliage. It's just the surface of the water. Uh, filling the canvas, the surface of the pond becomes a world all, almost onto itself, inspiring a sense of immersion in nature. Monet's observations of the changing patterns of light on the surface of the water become almost abstract. So these paintings were not fully appreciated in Monet's lifetime. And when they were reassessed in the 1950s, some uh, critics viewed them as precursors to abstract expressionism. So I just wanted to take a minute to show you the two paintings side by side. So you can really see the difference and you can really notice the difference uh, both in color that he's using um, also, as I said, the, the painting on the right is really the, the, the watery surface, just the surface, um, where here we have the bridge and we have the foliage. Um, also notice the brushstroke. Look at the large uh, brushstroke, the long brushstrokes that we have in the painting on the right. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite a different style. Um, so artists have talk about, talked about if this was a conscious change in Monet's style or if it's something else was going on. So um, as we know that in the last decades of Monet's life, his prized water garden became the most important and eventually the only subject of his paintings. So in 1912, when Monet was 72 years old, he was actually diagnosed with cataracts in both of his eyes. Um, now that meant that he was no longer seeing the colors in the same intensity, his whites, greens, and blues we're slowly transforming into muddier yellowish and purple tones. And we can see those purple and yellow tones in this painting. And also the greens are much darker. Um, also, we can see we have much larger brushstrokes in paint, painting and not as much of the light blue. So art, historian had, art historians have debated whether it was Monet's eyesight that led to these changes or if he intentionally adopted a broader and more abstract style in his paintings. Um, most of the art uh, historians believe that his later works were the result of his cataracts and it wasn't conscious experimentation with a more expressionist style. But either way, um, his, later arcs, his later works of art, which were created under the influence of his cataracts, really link impressionists with modern abstract art. Um, Monet made at least 25 paintings, drawings, and pastels during his life. He probably made more than that because uh, we know that he destroyed some of his paintings and some of them have been lost over time. The Met has 40 uh, Monet paintings, which we will look at in a minute in the gallery, but I just wanted to um, uh, show you, this is some of the Monet paintings we were just looking at. You can see how they look in the Met. Um, but I also wanted to show you, this is only part of, uh, you'll may, many of you will recognize it. This one is from the St. Louis Art Museum. I can only fit some of it uh, in my uh, screen, because the, the one in the St. Louis Art Museum is huge. It's a mural-sized painting. It's 78 and three-fourths inches by 13 feet. 
uh, and 11 inches. And it was actually part of a three panel work originally that is a mural that you're supposed to feel like you're immersed in it. Uh, I think one of the panels is in Cleveland and another is in another museum. But you, you guys have an amazing uh, Monet in your museum, which is not on view now. It must be traveling somewhere. Um, so it's not on view now, but a great painting to visit. Um, but now we'll just go into the Met um, so we can at least see some of these paintings in the museum and kind of get an idea of the size of them and what the rooms look like. So hopefully you'll re recognize, uh, we looked at this painting over here. Um, and again, not as clear, that's why I show you my PowerPoint, but just to get an idea. And here we have the one of Jean Monet on his hobby horse. This is a room of other Monet paintings. And you get a feeling of the idea that he was painting nature and different seasons, uh, different times of day, different weather conditions. Um, this is another room full of Monet paintings. So you'll recognize uh, we saw some of these, the haystacks and the, uh, the poplar trees. Um, and then we have this, um, whoops, I went too far back into our other room. So here, the, the Met actually has, uh, I think, three rooms of Monet paintings. So here we have the morning on the Seine River painting that we looked at. And then on this wall is the Monet water lily painting that we were just looking on it at. And caddy corner to it is the view of the footbridge. Um, so when you're in the museum, you can really look at these two Monet water lily paintings and um, uh, compare and contrast them. And we also have another Monet, which we didn't look at together, but we have another water lily painting as well uh, in the museum. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to another impressionist artist. Um, and that is Mary Cassatt. Um, Mary Cassatt is one of two female impressionists. She and Bertha Morissette are the two female impressionists. And what's unique about Mary Cassatt is she's the only American artist who was invited to join the impressionist artists. Uh, just a little bit of a background about Mary Cassatt, our, um, uh, the only female impressionist that we'll speak to today. She's one of two with Bertha Morissette, but we're only gonna look at Mary Cassatt today. She was born in 1844 to a wealthy family. She was one of five children and the family often took trips to Europe. Uh, so uh, she was uh, well-traveled and well, very much familiar with the art world in Europe. She went to art school, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and she decided at a very early age to become an artist which was not an acceptable path for a woman at the time. Uh, that's why she ended up marry, uh, moving to Paris and she lived there for most of her life because Paris was much more open to female artists than America was at the time. And it was also, of course, the capital of the art world. Now, Mary uh, Cassatt, she never married. She never had children of her own, um, but she chose to paint in her paintings and focus on the quiet domesticity of other women's lives. She often focuses, focuses on the topic of mother and child. Um, she found her subjects in her life around her. Her emphasis was on the world of women. Uh, and as you'll see in a couple of the paintings that we looked at, she depicted her visitors at tea. She often painted her sister and other family members. Um, and she painted them absorbed in needlework or reading or women going to opera, all which were deemed appropriate and socially acceptable activities for women at that time. So here's our first painting that we're looking at, which is a painting It's called Lydia Crocheting in the Garden at Marley. It was painted in 1880. The dimensions are 25 in, uh, inches by 36 inches. So Mary Cassatt and her family spent the summer of 1880 near Paris. Um, and Cassatt, as I said, um, often painted domestic environments. Here she's painting her older sister, Lydia, who is often a model for her paintings. She's very fashionably dressed and absorbed in a sort of old fashioned handicraft handicraft, which was increasingly prized at this time because uh, this was a time where factory man uh, manufactured clothing was escalating. So um, this kind of handiwork was much prized by um, well-to-do people. Although in general, Mary Cassatt was not as interested in on plain air painting, which is painting outdoors. Here you can see she used the outdoors as her background and she really captured the effects of the dazzling sunlight beautifully in this work, especially on Lydia's large white hat. Um, Lydia's face is shaded, by the, shaded from the sun by the bonnet she's wearing and she's warmly dressed in a blue coat and she's wearing fashionable gloves. Interesting that she is crocheting with gloves on, um, but that was uh, what, what was done at the time. We also see that Mary Cassatt painted the dense green foliage and also these purple border plants 
um, and it gives us a great color contrast. And here again, we'll, we'll point out the hallmarks of impressionist painting, visible brushstroke, a scene of everyday, uh, a scene of everyday life. And she also includes this on plain air, this background for her, for uh, this portrait painting, the background of an outdoor garden scene. Um, our next painting by Mary Cassatt is called The Cup of Tea. It was painted between 1880 and 1881, and the dimensions are 36 and 3 8 inches by 25 and 3 4 inches. So Mary Cassatt did a lot of paintings of tea, and you actually have a work of art in the St. Louis Art Museum uh, focusing on tea, which I'll show you. Um, and that's because taking afternoon tea was a social ritual for many upper middle class women. Uh, there were very, uh, there were rules surrounding tea time, very interesting. Visits were meant to be very brief, strict etiquette was followed, and conversation was limited to topics that were deemed acceptable. At that time, you didn't talk about a tea, you did not talk about religion or politics, it was mostly gossip. So as Mary Cassatt shows here, uh, callers, people coming to tea did not take off their bonnet or take off their gloves, and keeping them on offered a polite indication that they were just going to stay for a very short visit. Staying long would be viewed as rude. Um, again, Mary Cassatt was committed to portraying the ordinary events of everyday life, and that was the tea ritual. It was a subject of many of her paintings and many of her works of art around 1880, um, when, she is, when she had been living abroad for the better part of a, de a decade. In this painting as well, her, the model is her sister Lydia, who had moved to Paris along with uh, their parents in 1877, and she was often a model for, uh, for Mary. By the way, both Mary and Lydia Cassatt, neither one of them married. Uh, neither one of them got married or had children. Um, Cassatt's embrace of French Impressionism is signaled by her loose brushstroke and her emphasis on contrasting complementary colors. Uh, before we go on to our last painting in the Met of Mary Cassatt, I'm just going to show you a painting from the St. Louis Art Museum. And you can see the uh, subject matter, the similar subject matter. This is Afternoon Tea Party, painted in 1891. Uh, this is not a painting. This is actually a print. And this print invites viewers into a very charming domestic interior with a woman offering her visitor tea. Again, notice the visitor is wearing her bonnet and her gloves because you know the brevity of the visit, it would be rude to stay for too long. So you left on your bonnet and your gloves. Um, and you can see here that Mary Cassatt was in inspired by Japanese woodblock prints um, for their delicate washes of color and compressed space. So this is at the St. Louis Art Museum, although it's not on view now, um, but it is, it is there. Um, uh, you actually, there are two Mary Cassatt works of art at uh, the St. Louis Art Museum, but neither of them are on view right now. Um, okay, and our last Mary Cassatt painting from the Met is called Young Mother Sewing, painted in 1900. So this is about 20 years after our last painting. Uh, and you can see that her subject matter has changed and her focus now is women and children. And that really became the focus of her paintings at this time period. This painting is 36 inches by 29 inches. And at about in about 1890, Cassatt redirected her art towards the subject of women caring for children. Um, themes that reflected her affection for her nieces and nephews. Um, as, uh, as I said at the beginning, she was one of five children. So even, even though she and her sister Lydia didn't have uh, any children of their own, her brothers, uh, her three brothers had children and she had great affection for her nieces and nephews. And she did many paintings that included them as models. And at the time, people were also very interested in the topic of child rearing. So Cassette enlisted in this painting, these are not relatives of her. The models are not relatives of her. These are two unrelated models and they're enacting the roles of mother and child for this painting. Um, notice the truthfulness of the painting. Look at the child that has just thrown herself against the mother's knee, regardless of the res result and oblivious to the fact that she could disturb her mother who's busy, busy sewing. Um, but she's quite right. She doesn't disturb her mother. Her mother continues doing what she's doing. She simply draws back a little and continues to sew. And again, although Mary Cassatt never married or had children of her own, she made many, many paintings of the subject matter. Now, as we saw with all three of the Mary Cassatt paintings that we looked at, the women in Mary Cassatt's paintings find contentment in their solitude, whether while they're absorbed in a book, a cup of tea, as we saw, attentive to their needlework, work, or just deep in contemplation. Interesting, the subjects are usually not looking at the viewer, but they're looking at the work. So here we see she's looking at her sewing, uh, in our last painting, uh, she's looking at her teacup. 
and she's looking at her needlework. So they're not looking at the viewer, but they're looking at their work. But their faces express concentration. And although they're engaged in a ver variety of activities, they all share a sense of tranquil self-fulfillment. Uh, the Metropolitan actually owns more than 100 paintings, prints, and pastels by Mary Cassatt. So now we're going to move on to our last artist that we're talking about today, and that is Auguste Renoir. And he worked alongside other Impressionists, but he's actually very well known for his portrait paintings, which he painted in the Impressionist style with visible brushstroke. And the reason he did a lot of uh, portraits was for very practical reasons. He hoped to secure a livelihood by getting portrait commissions, and he succeeded in doing this. And this is one of his very well-known portrait paintings and where he got a very large commission. Uh, this is a painting called Madame Charpentier and her children. It was painted in 1878. It's a large painting. It's 60 and a half inches by 74 and 7 fourths inches. So in this commissioned portrait, Renoir gave expression to the poetry of an elegant home and the beautiful dresses of the time. Look at the details he put in the, the dresses. We can almost imagine touching the, the fabrics and what they would feel like. So here we have the woman, uh, Marguerite Chapentier. She sits in the Japanese style sitting room of her Parisian townhouse. And uh, we can see she had very stylish, uh, stylish taste. Look at their, their paintings and the, on the walls in the background and look at all the, uh, the furniture and the design as well. Um, now she is sitting next to two of her children. And if you take a moment and look at the painting, at first glance, you might think that perhaps these children are twins uh, because they're dressed alike. But if you look closer, you'll notice that the uh, child sitting on the dog is older. Uh, her name is Georgette and she's three years, three years older than her sibling. And an interesting thing to uh, learn about this painting is that the other child that's sitting on the couch next to um, uh, Madame Charpentier is actually uh, a boy. His name is Paul Charpentier. He was three years old at the time of the painting. And if you remember from our earlier painting, when we saw um, Claude Monet's son, Jean, and I talked about the styles of the time period that dresses were very uh, uh, um, popular for, for even young boys to wear uh, for toilet training purposes, but also, at the age of three, many uh, boys, uh, their hair would be grown out. Uh, you can see his locks are still uncut, which was fashionable. And also very fashionable was to be uh, dressed in a dress. He's dressed identical to his sister, Georgette. Uh, Georgette, his sister, is sitting on the family dog, whose name is Porthos. Um, now, although they're dressed very identical, it's and you, you can't see, but Georgette is actually wearing jewelry. She has a bracelet on her hand, which... Paul does not have. She also has little heels on her shoes, which could be because uh, it's a little more feminine, but also she was older, so she would have heels on her shoes. Um, now, the husband, uh, Madame Chapentier's husband, is not in the portrait. He is painted in a separate portrait by Monet, uh, by uh, Renoir, and his portrait is at the, uh, uh, at the Barnes Museum uh, collection. Um, but her husband was a well-connected publisher, and she hosted elite literary salons in her home, which were attended by many known writers at the time. So Madame Chapentier used her influence to make sure that this painting enjoyed a very good spot at the Salon of 1879. The Salon, of course, was where artists exhibited their work of art to the public. It was a very influential event. And Madame Chapentier made sure that this painting had a good spot at the Salon. And of course, that was great for Renoir because he got a lot of attention uh, as a painter. Um, by the end of the 1870s, particularly after the success of this painting and the salon I mentioned of 1879, Renoir was a very successful and fashionable painter uh, at that time. Uh, so here we have a close up of Paul and Georgette, and you can see they're um, kind of looking at each other here. We can also see um, the brushwork uh, of the the material on the couch that they're sitting on. Um, something else that's very interesting about the painting is that, of course, there's a lot going on in this painting as well. You can see in the back, there's a table that has grapes and a vase of flowers. There are paintings on the wall. Um, so the way that uh, Renoir set it up is it's almost like a triangle in the middle of the painting, which includes the faces and the heads of Madame Chapetier and her children so that we can kind of focus in on that and then notice the details around. Also notice how he has Madame Chapentier wearing black and white. 
Also their dog Porthos has black and white fur. And then the two children are wearing similar cl clothing. So it's a way to unify the painting. Uh, the reason Madame Chapentier is wearing black is because she was actually in mourning for a uh, child. She had lost a son. And it was um, at that time, it was a custom to wear black um, for a good part of a year after uh, while you were in mourning. So here we have a close-up of the children and a close-up of the dog Porthos, who doesn't look very happy. And that could be because uh, Georgette is sitting on him. Um, now, the last two Renoir paintings we're going to look at, even though the Met has a number of Renoir paintings, um, we're going to look at two Renoir paintings from other collection. This one, just because I think it's such a fantastic painting um, that I didn't think I could talk about Renoir without looking at it. It's called Luncheon of the Boating Party. Um, it's at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. The size of it is 51 inches in, uh, by 68 inches. And it's one of Renoir's most famous and one of his largest works of art. Um, it's also one of the most well-known depictions of an alfresco lunch outing, uh, probably uh, the most well-known in art history of this kind of outdoor scene. Um, it's set in Paris overlooking the Seine River. You can see it a little bit in the background over here. And the painting really captures a joyous moment among friends. Uh, it's incredible. This painting um, uh, shows Renoir's skill, combining his skill in painting portraits and figures in painting still life. If you look at the table, it's a still life. And in painting landscape, where you can see the, the Seine River and the water in the background, all in one painting. So in one painting, we have portraits, still life, and uh, landscape in one work of art. And it actually depicts a group of Renoir's friends and others relaxing on a balcony at a restaurant called the Maison Fournay. And it was located along the Seine River in France. The restaurant was about a 30 minute train ride from Paris. Um, interestingly, the painting includes both friends and colleagues of Renoir. It also includes his future wife. I'm pointing to her here. Her name was Elaine Cherigo. She's in the foreground playing with a small dog. You can see she's very much concentrating on this dog. Renoir painted this, uh, specifically painted her looking at the dog and not looking around. Um, everyone else in the painting, a lot of the people are flirting with each other or interacting, men and women, but he didn't want his girlfriend to be a part of that. So she is just focusing on her dog in this painting. So Renoir asked his friends and colleagues to come to the Maison, uh, Maison Fernet, the restaurant, to pose in person. And he perfected each portrait one by one. And we actually know who most of the people in this painting are. In the far back, you can see the man in the top hat. He was a noted art collector and historian. His name was Charles Efrusi. And he is speaking to a poet. Um, on the right, we have friends of Renoir who are um, flirting with a uh, actress over here. You can see a lot of flirting going on in this painting. Also, we have Renoir's affluent patron and fellow painter who is sitting here in the lower right-hand corner. And he is talking with this actress. Uh, and uh, this is an Italian journalist. Um, so a lot of Renoir's friends and, and colleagues, and you can see many of them involved in the art world. And then of course we have this table, which looks like a still life setup. Now, uh, this is a very busy painting, but here we have a diagonal railing which kind of demarcates the painting in two halves, two halves of this composition. On the right half, we have a very densely packed painting with many, many figures. Um, the other half doesn't have a lot of figures. We just have two figures on the other side and they are actually the, uh, uh, the owner of the restaurant. These are his two children who work there, his daughter and her brother. They both worked uh, at the restaurant. Notice the contrast between uh, working class people uh, and more, I guess, high society people. Notice the contrast in their clothing and also their hats. Um, however, the mingling of the men and women from different classes reflected uh, how the divisions of class and French culture were starting to dissolve. Uh, also, what's amazing about this painting to notice is the vast array of different hats that were fashionable at the time. We have, we have straw hats, we have a lot of straw hats, we have cloche hats, we have top hats, we have bowler hats, all kinds of really interesting hats in this painting which show us the fashion at the time. Uh, Renoir has actually also captured a lot of light in this painting and it really, there's a lot of light here. We can imagine the conversation and uh, all the things that are going on uh, in this painting. Uh, so, before we go into the Met for 
uh, a, vir a, a virtual tour, I just want to mention that the St. Louis Art Museum has four Renoir works of art. Three of them are in view now, including a sculpture in the Sculpture Garden. And one of them I just learned recently, which is very exciting. This is at the St. Louis Art Museum. Many of you probably recognize it. This is actually a painting done by Renoir of his father. And uh, it was painted in 1869 when the artist was only 28 years old. His father was 70 in this painting. You can see signed it with a year. Uh, his father was a tailor. Um, notice this painting is so different from our last paintings, right? Notice the, the color, very limited, very restrained palette in this painting, basically shades of black and white offset by the pink flesh tones. Um, so this was done again when Renoir was only 28 years old in 1869, um, as opposed to the other paintings we were looking at. Um, this one was done in 1881. This one was done in 1878. So you can see a real difference. Another very interesting thing about this painting, it was painted, painted when Renoir, unfortunately, was having a difficult time financially. He was 28 years old, so he had to live at home. Perhaps that's why his father looked so stern, because his you know, son was living with them at home and he was having to support him. Um, but I think this is a wonderful painting, and it's at, uh, uh, at the St. Louis Art Museum. So before we end, I just want to uh, um, jump into the the Met for one quick look at the Renoir paintings. Um, this is, so you'll notice right away, our large painting of Madame Chapentier and her children. And notice how large it is compared to some of the smaller Renoir portraits. And again, Renoir did a lot of portraits. So you can see um, some of his other portraits on this wall over here. Um, and uh, these are a number of paintings that the Met has, but the most famous one the Met has and one of his most famous portraits, again, is this Madame Chapentier painting. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna end um, here. I hope everyone enjoyed our talk on Impressionism and uh, traveling to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was very exciting for me also to learn a little bit about the St. Louis Art Museum's uh, Impressionist collection as well. Um, so I think we're gonna open up to questions for anyone who has questions or comments and wants to uh, stay for that part of the talk. Ilana, I think there are some um, questions and comments also in the chat. You might want to check that. And okay. if you want to close Great. out your slides, then uh, more people can appear uh, on the screen. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So I'm going to check the chat and we have uh, Oh, the name of the church. Okay, so the name of the church is, uh, and my French is not great, it's uh, Saint uh, Clotilde is the name of the church um, that you can see in the background. Um, okay, yes, the shadows, the shadows, I, I'm assuming that's Monet's father, the shadows of father, right? And that tells us that it was the uh, afternoon in the painting. Okay, and I'm not sure uh, you had other, I guess, Monet painting maybe for a special so showing. Linda, Linda uh, is actually got her hand up, so I think she wants to explain her comments. Linda, why don't you Great. go ahead? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. That was just wonderful. Thank and you. You were showing some of my very favorite paintings, so it was even more fun for me. I know I was talking about we had a special showing at the art museum where they brought in the large Monet's and, and we were surrounded. It felt you submerged in it. They were so huge, you know. Um, so that was wonderful. The other thing I wanted to comment on is Pizarro because uh, my husband and I have been to St. Thomas several times. In fact, we are what I guess you call absentee members of the synagogue there, the one with oh, the wow. sand floor. And yes. that synagogue has a museum in it with all the information about Pizarro and when he was you know, born there and then his progress to Paris and so on. So it's a wonderful small, it's a small museum in, in the shul. But uh, yeah, it was great to see that there also. So thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. And thank you for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, and I actually saw on the website that it looks like the uh, St. Louis Art Museum is having an exhibit, uh, Monet um, and uh, um, Joe Mitchell paintings starting at the end of March. 
so that looks like that'll be really interesting. Um, and MoMA also has that um, similar, they have, MoMA has the large mural paintings where they have it in a room where you go in and they have couches in the middle and you feel like you're surrounded, uh, kind of immersed in the water lily garden, which is what Monet was working on in his later paintings. And he really wanted people to experience, you know, uh, his garden through his paintings. So thank you so much for sharing that. Especially that with uh, him, his eyesight. You know, they painted these huge pieces where now some people were saying he went blind. They didn't necessarily talk about cataracts. They just were saying he went blind and he painted a lot of this when he was blind, which, you know, is not quite the case. But that was some of the comments that people thought. Hmm. So does anybody else have any comments or questions? Because um, I think this has been a remarkable program and uh, we're very, very appreciative of your time, Alana. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for coming and I hope to see everyone next month. Okay. Um, it'll be a very different talk, Alice Neal, uh, very different talk, but I hope, to see, I hope to see you all there. Thank you everyone. We, thanks, Alana. Bye, Thank have you. a great day. Okay, bye-bye.